Welcome to the Equipping You in Grace podcast, hosted by Dave Jenkins. The Equipping You in Grace podcast is a podcast about helping Christians develop a biblical worldview in a conversational tone about issues inside and outside the church. Now, for today's episode, let's join our host, Dave Jenkins. All right, guys, welcome back to the Equip You and Grace podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for the show. And with me today, uh, we get to welcome to the show our my friend and sister in Christ, Don Hill. Don, welcome to Equip You and Grace. Thanks for having me on, Dave. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. I'm really excited about this. I know you have uh, a lot to say about the topic that we're going to talk about, and so uh, before we get to that, though, can you tell us a lo- a little bit about your life, your marriage, uh, what you do ministry-wise, um, writing, podcasting, those types of things, and any ministry projects that you're particularly excited about? Yeah, well, um, for those that don't know me, I'm, my name is Dawn Hill. Um, I am from Virginia. That's where we uh, reside. I have a husband I've been married to for uh, 17 years this year. And we have two children. Uh, We have a a daughter and a son, um, Annabelle and Ephraim. And um, as far as um, the ministry that I do, I focus mainly on um, ministering to other women that are coming out of this type of movement, the hyper charismatic new apostolic reformation. Um, I'm a a blogger. I've been a blogger. I was a blogger in this movement. And then that drastically changed. after I came out of it, it started changing before that um, to some degree, but um, that was before I really, God woke me up in the, in what was going on and what I was involved in. But the, the blog has drastically changed to really address the issues, the topics and the beliefs that I once held to and trying to help other people to go back to scripture, always guiding people back to the gospel, back to the scripture. And um, I also do a podcast I started in 2020 um, that correlates with my blog. And so that seems to be helpful to some people to see and to hear. And I'm always, I'm, I'm never wanting to attack people. I'm always looking at the teaching um, and saying, go back to the word of God in context. As far as ministry projects, I do, um, I do write for Christianity.com. So I write articles for them. And also um, recently I co-partnered, started co-partnering with um, a friend and sister in Christ, Emily Massey. And so we, are uh, co-leading a women's discipleship group together to help women that have come out of this and to offer some some help and assistance to them and support and created uh, she created this group and and graciously asked me to be a part of it and so we're helping these women and and encouraging them guiding them back to scripture and um, offering prayer and support in that way so that's what I do yeah that's really great wonderful yeah I'm looking forward to I have a few episodes that I'm going to be listening to here soon and so i'm i'm excited about that and to hear hear more about that but uh can you uh tell us uh, about how you came out of the new apostolic reformation yeah um it it seems or sounds rather kind of dramatic and um it happened in 2019 Uh, so the ministry that i was part of i was part of it for almost 20 years it was uh, about 18 years that my husband and i were part of this ministry it was all i ever knew Um, so I was not raised in church, um, and the church that we were part of, it was more of, um, word of faith, uh, initially a lot of, uh, Kenneth Hagin teachings, um, the minister that I was under, he was affiliated with Norval Hayes, which was affiliated with Kenneth Hagin, Copeland and all those, but the last five to seven years that we were there, um, he really started embracing being an apostle and, I didn't realize at the time, but we were always being indoctrinated with the, the fivefold ministry along the way. And I had attended a Bible a Bible college that was part of the church and um, went all six years to get my doctorate in theology, which was not a real doctorate. But at any rate, um, so I was well indoctrinated with a lot of this teaching. And the belief was is that the apostles and prophets were being um, were being restored in order to govern the church. So they were looked upon as. This, but the new apostolic reformation was never a term that was used. 
So fast forward to 2019, um, I was very much personally entrenched in this movement. Um, I was identified as a prophet in this movement by the apostle I was under and several other people. Um, I was affiliated with uh, Jennifer LeClaire, um, a few other leaders that would come in. And also um, I was being considered for writing uh, Bible studies for the Passion Translation. So Brian Simmons had actually seen my blog and had contacted me via email in 2017. He reached out to his publishing house. They contacted me. So that was a couple years in the making, but it never happened. Thank the Lord. So that was all that had all culminated into this moment in 2019. This was all going on. I was I was deep into this movement. And I cannot explain fully what happened, except that the Lord opened my eyes and my ears to hear and to see what was going on. We were in a service in 2019. Um, the apostle we were under um, had done what was called, a, he called it the Daniel tour. And he was going around to different churches and ministering and ministering from the book of Daniel. And there were things going on during that service that seemed very familiar, um, but it was during an offering message that he began to minister and to misappropriate scripture now looking back. And those were the moments, it's really ironic to me, Dave, when I think about it. I think about how twisted the scripture was, but God used that. He used his word, even though it was manipulated, to, to wake me up. And so the first scripture that Ryan used, Ryan Lestrange was the, the individual that I was under for almost 20 years. He, um, and he identifies that as, as a big A apostle. Um, but he um, misappropriated John 10, 27. He was ministering on spiritual sons and daughters are, are to obey their spiritual father, or to listen, I'm sorry, listen to their spiritual fathers. And in that, he appropriated that scripture. And he said, you know, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. And they do what I say. And it was in that moment I'm sitting there and I thought, I don't think that's what that scripture says. And then a little bit later in the offering message, he said, my sheep here, uh, he, I'm sorry, he said that spiritual sons and daughters are to obey their spiritual fathers. And in that, he said, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And it was in that moment that I, I physically <laughs> like a, like a, a jolt or a knee jerk reaction to that. And I began immediately going, what am I sitting under? Mm -hmm. um, and so I look at that and I think um, that God used those moments of his, even in his word being misappropriated. It reminds me of Isaiah 55, 11, where, where the Lord talks about that his word will, will do what it's sent out to do. Basically I'm paraphrasing, but his word is meant to, to bring us back to him and to minister the gospel essentially. And so that's how I look at that. But at, at, at any rate, not to be long winded about this, but that happened in February of 2019. Um, there were two services that happened right after that, the, the day after those services, my husband and I went to the local leadership and expressed concerns because there were things said that seemed like that the leadership was being attacked on the, on the platform by Ryan. And we didn't, we just didn't understand what was going on. So we went and asked questions and expressed concerns. Um, and also during that time, um, there was a Facebook post that I shared from another minister that Ryan really didn't care much for. And he started commenting on that post when he normally didn't comment on my things. And, and I, now I know um, from what I found out is that he does have people surveil social media, um, whether they willingly do it or, but they let him know when people are posting things or they're attending someone else's conferences, um, that are kind of looked at as opposing and such. Anyway, that caused a problem. So he called a meeting with me and I thought it was because of the Facebook post, but, um, he ended up finding after he called the meeting with me, he ended up finding out about the meeting with the local leaders, which was fine. So there were two meetings. Um, each meeting was about two and a half to three hours long. And in those meetings, I was accused of rebellion and I was accused of dishonoring the founder of the house. And I was accused of praying against praying against him during the service of trying to bind him. Um, he said that the other ministers that traveled there with him said that there was something wrong with the prophetic atmosphere of the house. They said there was something wrong with me um, because I was labeled 
for lack of better words, I mean, I was labeled as like the prophet of the house there locally. Um, I was not the only prophet prophet that was identified, but I was one of the main ones. Um, So in that meeting, that's what I was accused of. And uh, the second meeting was more hostile um, about that. There were other things that were said not related to me, but it became clear to me that the ministry was more of a business than an actual ministry. Um, At the end of that second meeting, I was told I was to be, I was sat down because I was considered like a threat to the church there and that I was in rebellion and dishonor because of my actions of asking questions. He was not happy with the fact that I asked questions even in the first meeting. He made that very clear that he was an apostle and that nine out of 10 apostles would not have another meeting with me um, and that he knew that he was busy and he had better things to do at this time, but he knew he needed to deal with this issue. So I was sat down for six weeks. I was not allowed to do anything in the church. I wasn't even allowed to print off prayer requests. And I don't know if they were afraid that I was going to attach some demonic entity or something, but he accused me essentially of having demonic entities in a way. Um, So I was basically given um, stipulations in that second meeting. And I said that I couldn't answer that question at the time. So that's why I was sat down. Um, And then after the six weeks, those were reiterated to me in an email and I was given 30 days to respond to this email and to the stipulations. And the stipulations were that I was to submit to him as an apostle and I was to submit to his, uh, to a, a prophet of his choosing that would evaluate me and find out what was spiritually wrong with me and then report back to Ryan to see if I could be re, um, reestablished or, um, um, placed back under his apostolic umbrella of authority to see if I was able to minister once again. And when I got the letter, um, I told my, told my husband about the letter and he said, you can't do that. And I said, I know, I, I, I knew well enough to know. And there, through the years, there were many people that had left and we had heard Ryan and his wife's side of the story. And then uh, after coming out of this, people started me- privately reaching out to me and sharing their side of why they left. And it was similar stories. I mean, over and over, just different person, same story. And um, we, we began to realize that this was beyond just us. Um, This has been going on for a long time with some levels of spiritual abuse and things. So I got the letter a week later, I sent a letter um, back to Ryan and said that uh, we had decided that we would be leaving the church. And so that was in, that was a day after Easter. I got that letter in 2019 We left the church May 15th on Mother's Day of 2019. Um, And it was at that point that I began to start looking into what had happened to us, what we were part of. And it was devastating. I mean, we we lost a lot of relationships because of that. I had we walked away from a lot um, in that ministry. Everything that I know for me, everything I'd ever known um, was was wrapped up in in that. And so it was basically just a, a, a dismantling of um, coming down to the foundation of my faith. And that was the only thing I was certain of is that my faith in Christ and rebuilding from there and going back to scripture. Um, and I saw the American gospel. I don't know how I came across the American gospel, but I did and began to watch it. And from there, um, the things about the word of faith began unraveling as I began to search them out. And um, then I became aware that I w- had been part of the New Apostolic Reformation um, because of the beliefs that I'd sat under and I had believed for so long. So, um, yeah, I mean, we came out of that in 2019 and the Lord has graciously allowed me to be able to understand his word better. And um, I believe that he was merciful and he allowed me to repent of uh, being, I was a false prophet. I consider myself a false prophet in this movement, and I and I had to repent of that. It wasn't just acknowledging the the, the false teacher I was under. It was acknowledging that I was guilty of of not being a good Berean and not um, not understanding Scripture properly, and um, really uh, bringing reproach on the name of Christ because of the things that I had said and I had done and I had written and I had spoken and stating that God said them when He didn't. Um, and, I, and for that, I am very thankful. And so um, I get to, um, we're in a, a solid biblical church now, and I get to um, hear the, the word taught and be ministered to. Um, 
and to continue to grow in, in understanding scripture and in that growing in my fellowship with Christ. And uh, for that, I am thankful. And I'm also thankful that my children are not going to be part of this movement either. So praise God, you know, well, first, I'm, I'm so sorry that you experienced that, you know, significant spiritual abuse that I've heard many stories about that. And it's it's heartbreaking. It's tragic, not only coming out of the new apostolic reformation, but it happens in the church. And so, yeah, um, I mean, I'm just sorry that you experienced that um, and the false teaching. But, you know, praise God. Um, he's sovereign. Mm -hmm. and he opened your eyes and he has you know, brought you out of that. And now you're helping other people to come out of that. So that's, uh, that's really wonderful. Um, truly, you know, I, I think you kind of answered this and sharing Amen. your, I think you kind of shared this, uh, in answering, you know, about your testimony, but just maybe for, to be clear for somebody who's wondering what is this movement and what should they look for when it comes to the new apostolic reformation? You know, like defining marks, things that, you know, they, they might not realize that are happening. It's it's not just simply I've heard some people um, make them draw the false conclusions that, oh, it's just about all of us that believe in signs and wonders or that all of us that are continuationists. That's not the hallmark of the movement. Those things can be affiliated. But the main hallmark of the, the movement is the belief that uh, governing apostles and prophets are being restored to the church today that, that they've been missing for 2000 years and that they need to be restored in order for the great commission to go forth. Um, and that in order for pastors to be relevant, in order for them to fulfill the great commission, they must come underneath an apostle. Um, and apostles are uh, believed to be um, the, the governing authority, uh, uh, but like it's usually like if I was taught, it was like the fivefold of courses, they, they, uh, equivalent to a hand and they say this is like the fivefold but they say like ryan used to say this is the apostle and the apostle can touch all of the five um all the other four and so they can function in that all at different times so the apostle is is noted as being the builder the prophet is like the visionary that helps give uh work alongside the apostle to give the vision and then the apostle fulfills the vision and and they are looked upon as the foundation and and to say that they don't believe that is not true because they appeal to Ephesians 2:20 they appeal to 1 Corinthians 12:28 they appeal to um the Acts 2 I was taught that about how you're supposed to uh submit to the apostles teaching they'll they'll say different verses like that and they'll appeal to the apostles of Christ while trying to say that they don't believe they're apostles of Christ but they use those verses as the example um, which makes no sense whatsoever when you actually look at it. You can't say that you're not when those are the verses that you're using to appeal to being an apostle. So um, I would say that's the defining mark. And then along with that, you will see a lot of these beliefs, such as um, the spiritual warfare, like the prayer mapping and um, in decreeing and declaring, um, taking authority over d the demonic forces, uh, the passion translation is used quite a bit in a lot of this movement. Um, the prophetic is is how extra biblical revelation is highlighted. Um, there's a lot of the seven mountains, seven mountain movement, seven mountain mandate. That's another one. So there's a lot of different areas that can be affiliated with this. Not all leaders will demonstrate those beliefs or those traits, but the defining one is governing apostles and prophets. Really good. What advice do you have for those coming out of the new apostolic reformation? Well, the first thing is, is to make sure that there is a proper understanding of the gospel. I think that that is that is actually the the key thing that I am always steering these women back to whenever I talk to them or they message me um, is making sure you have an understanding of the gospel, because my belief is that a lot of people that are in this are biblically illiterate. And they may have heard portions of the gospel. They may very well be believers and they're just deceived or blinded by what they're hearing and te the teachings. But mm -hmm. it's always important to go back and make sure there's a proper understanding of the gospel and that you've heard the gospel correctly according to scripture. Mm -hmm. The other thing, too, is um, getting into the word of God mm -hmm. um, and making that a 
priority of reading the Word of God, studying the Word of God, finding a biblically solid church. There's a lot of people that come out of this that they're very fearful of trying to find a church because they don't want to be deceived again. They have legitimately been abused in some way, shape, or fashion. They don't trust the leadership. They don't even trust themselves um, to know what is right and what is wrong. Finding a biblically solid church is vital. Um, rather than isolate yourself um, and trying to figure things out on your own. And there's good resources that are out there to find a biblically solid church. But those are those are the main things I would tell someone. Yeah. So I, I think that's really um, it's tragic, you know, what you were just sharing, because, you know, and I think this really highlights the point about biblical literacy. Like if you can't go to the pastor um, or your, or one of the elders of the church, or even one of the deacons, or a trusted seasoned Christian in your church, you know that's mature in the faith. Um, then you know you're going to have you're never going to be able to get those questions answered. And so it's tragic to me that you know Ryan would would do that. And um, you know that's that's just I, I don't know any pastor that I know well that would would ever do that. Um, they would do the opposite. You come to them with an honest yeah. question. And even if you they think that you might know it, you know, they're not going to look down your down their nose at you. They're, they might be like, well, you probably should know that if you've been a Christian a long time, but they're not going to they're not going to come down hard on you or whatever. They might be a little bit concerned, depending on the, the question. It's like super basic. But, you know, even there, they're they're going to still help you and, you know, come alongside of you. And so. Anyway, I just say all that to say it's no surprise then that, like you said, that there would be biblical literacy as an issue. Right. Yeah, questions were definitely not welcome. Yeah. And and, and I, the thing was, too, is that we never had a problem with them in all the 18 years that we were there. We were never called in for discipline or anything like that and not not had any problems. But the moment that I began, well, both of us asked questions. And that was the thing, too. I was the one that was disciplined. My husband overran the media team and he was not sat down. Mm. Both of us went to that meeting mm. and and both of us asked questions. But I was the one that was targeted because I was the prophet. And so how dare I question the the apostle? Um, <clears throat> the qu uh, questions were not welcome. The moment that I started questioning, either one of us started questioning, that was when we were called into question of our loyalty, of our ability to show honor of our rebellious nature. Um, yeah, it's, it was, um, it was rather eye opening at that moment. What yeah. the, what happened? But I, I can, I can tell you that this isn't a problem only with the new apostolic reformation growing up in the church and with seeing the things that I saw and then being in ministry for 20, almost 23 years um, in August. I can tell you that this is a problem in the church just in general, where, you know, right. we have people that come and it's like, it's okay to have questions if you're asking a sincere question. If you're asking a question yeah. to be, you know, difficult or obstinate or something like that, that's a whole nother question. But if you have, there's nothing wrong with wrestling with your faith. The, the issue is the the part that's sinful is when you're doing it with the wrong motive. Right. Um, and you're just doubting to to doubt because it's so cool and you know, you 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 think that you're super spiritual to do it. That is the problem, right? Um, in fact, we could anyway. There's a long history of that that we see in the church, and I've unfortunately I've seen it up close and personal. So, you know, it's it's sad, but don't be afraid, guys, to ask those questions that you have and to to seek those answers and find good re solid resources. Um, so, you know, what do you, I know there's those out there. They say that the new apostolic reformation is kind of like the boogeyman. It's not a real thing. How do you, how do you respond to that? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, that's really interesting. And it's frustrating. Um, when I hear people say, and, and granted there are people out there that don't know, I had no idea what I was part of. Um, and I was in it. So I know that there are people that legitimately don't know that they're in this because they they've never heard that, that people don't refer to it, that are in it. However, just because that's not what you call it doesn't mean that you're not part of it. 
<laughs> that's the that's the the thing that that like this dis dissociation that that begins to take place is that well I don't know what that is so I can't be part of it, but you are if you believe that there are governing apostles and prophets that exist today that can have revelation that even though they say it's not it is on par with scripture they believe it's authoritative if you don't listen to them they will make an example out of you, um, so that's the one thing the well I would say this. I defer to books, to videos, to uh, to um, articles that are written by these people. And I've got some of these pulled for it, just for example. This one right here. Mm. This book was written, it's called Modern Day Apostles. It was written by Shayon, which is, he was a protege, a spiritual son of C. Peter Wagner. C. Peter Wagner was the one that actually... Um, he created the term New Apostolic Reformation. Um, and for those that don't know who Wagner is, he was uh, really known for uh, his understanding of church growth. He wrote many books about church growth, and he was credited with creating this term because he said that he noticed a trend in three different movements that took place. And he cited this as the New Apostolic Reformation. He was the one that that. It, he said that this was taking place and that we were in the second apostolic age that began in 2001, I believe he said, but he, Shayon was under Wagner. Well, this book right here by Shayon was um, endorsed by several people that you would know in here, Robert Henderson, Patricia King, um, Mark Sharona, Sean Bold, James Gall, Chris Vallotton, Robert Morris, Cindy Jacobs, um, Lou Engel. The foreword was written by Bill Johnson. 2019, and I want to read, if it's okay, Go just a couple it. of small things in here. Uh, for example, on page 25, again, this book was written in 2019, published in 2019 by Destiny Image. Um, page 25, Shayon says, we can now say we are living in the new apostolic age because God is restoring the truth that the gift and the office of apostles is for today. When we go on uh, to page 26, he has a heading called Modern Day Apostles, the New Apostolic Reformation. On page 33 of this book, he says, quote, the gift and office of apostle not only function today, but we are living in a new age that Peter Wagner has defined as the new apostolic reformation. Modern day apostles will contribute to a more dramatic transformation of the church than anything else since the Protestant Reformation. Apostles are key to discipling nations. They are the key to fulfilling the Great Commission. Peter Wagner used the word apostolic because the people in and around this movement believe in apostles today. On page 39, he has a working definition of an apostle. He believes an apostle is a Christ-like ambassador with extraordinary authority, called and sent out by Jesus Christ with a special assignment to align the church to bring heaven's culture to earth and fulfill the mandate to disciple nations. He goes on later on that same page to say God is bringing about an apostolic reformation. And on page 123 of this book, a chapter, a chapter 15 that's titled Apostles Govern, Shayon says apostles govern. The word govern is defined as to exercise continuous sovereign authority, especially to control and direct the making and administration of policy. Now, the question I have is, if the people that endorse this book don't know what the New Apostolic Reformation is, then I don't know what they read because it's all throughout. It's throughout this book. Shayon did not conceal it. It's clear in this book. And there's I'm sure there's other examples in that book. Another one I'll appeal to is Dominion. This is an old book that was reprinted. I had the old copy. I have a whole little stack of books that are research purposes only over on the shelf. This book was reprinted by Destiny Image last year. Mm. This book was written by C. Peter Wagner. Mm. And in this book, I mean, he talks about open theism and uh, lots of other, lots of things in this book. But for example, on page 21, um, Peter Wagner has a heading a subheading called a massive movement when he's talking about a new wine, the second apostolic age. And he says, it is it important to know up front that this is a massive movement? And he talks about the different areas of the church that acknowledge this movement, talks about the new apostolic reformation by name in here. And then he goes on on page 24 to, to mention about how in the seventies, excuse me, the office of the intercessor was reestablished. And then in the, the 1980s, the gift and office of prophet began to be reaffirmed by the body of Christ. And then he says on page 24, the decade of the 1990s saw the beginning of the recognition of the gift and office of apostle in today's church. 
True, many Christian leaders do not as yet believe that we now have legitimate apostles on the level of, level of Peter or Paul or John, but a critical mass of the church agrees that they are here. So this, he's talking, and he goes on to mention the example of um, International Coalition of Apostles, which is now called ICAL. It's been changed to International Coalition of Apostolic Leaders, which they removed some of, of Wagner's statements and phrases on there, because I saw that, and I know Holly noted that as well, which was really neat when I talked to her. She mentioned that, and I said, oh, yeah, I noticed that, too, that I had actually gone on their website when I was doing research, and then I went back uh, literally a week or so later, and it just so happened they had scrubbed some of the things that Wagner had stated, but you still find the the remnants of them still believing that apostles are governing. And then, the, I mean, these are just a few of the books, but this was another one, um, The Systematic Theology for the New Apostolic Reformation. This one actually has changed titles. It's written by Harold Eberly, but the, um, the foreword was written by C. Peter Wagner, which Eberly really influenced Wagner and his belief in his eschatological beliefs and and things. So those are a few examples. So to answer your question, Dave, I defer to those books. And I say, you explain to me how this is not a real movement when it's in print. It's also on videos, too. I mean, these people, these leaders will minister this from public platforms. It's all over the place. So how can this not be a real thing when they've written and they, they've spoken about it? I wish we could have a fire emoji show up right now because that's uh, that's what that is. I mean, you <laughs> just conclusively proved they have a yeah. systematic theology. So by definition, movements have creeds and they have beliefs and they have convictions. So yeah. boom, mic drop. Um, you know, but uh, anyway, you know, uh, we we saw. I I know that you've recently talked about uh, this movie come out in Jesus' name by. Greg Luck. Maybe just tell us a little bit about that movie um, and then what most concerns you about it. This movie, in my understanding, um, Greg Locke has mentioned that it's highlighting, it's a documentary and it was created in six months, but it, it highlights his um, understanding and his change in beliefs from being a cessationist to now believing in Christian deliverance. Now, deliverance ministry, and they highlight this with um, men that refer to themselves as demon slayers, Isaiah Saldivar, Alexander Pagani, Mike Signorelli, Daniel Adams, just to name a few of those. There's other ones. But the movie, I've not seen it. I did read um, a review that a pastor wrote about it. And I have watched I mean, I can't tell you how many videos I've watched on YouTube of them doing deliverance ministry. I was part of a ministry that believed in and in, in practiced deliverance. Um, not to this necessarily this extreme that they do, but still it was practiced. And the whole belief in, in deliverance ministry is that Christians have indwelling demons and need them cast out. And these men teach that it is the Christian that needs demons cast out, not unbelievers. And then there's a game of semantics played with the word demon possessed. And they will say, well, you know, we cast demons out of Christians, but we don't believe they're demon possessed. Um, and there's different teachings that are perpetuated. These teachings have been around for decades. I mean, I'm not saying anything new. I'm sure that there's lots of people that know more about this than I do. But these teachings have been around for decades. This is not anything new. This was going on years and years ago. And these men and women are taking old material and just putting a fresh face on it is what they're doing. Um, because people, these Christians or professing Christians, and I know that that probably is offensive to people, but there are, I would, sad to say, there are probably a lot of these people that are not born again that they're having these manifestations, which I find troubling is that you see these people writhing around the floor, coughing, vomiting, they're encouraged to do this. I, I'm worried and concerned that this is, um, it's, it's really, um, prepping people it's cause it's telling them, well, you're, you probably are going to have this happen. And so these people are seeing this take place. Some of it, could be spiritually going on, but at any rate, I the focus is is that it's in Christians that this is happening. 
Um, they're encouraged to, to vomit, to cough things up to, because they say that uh, a demon is a spirit. And so you just as you breathe it in, you breathe it out. They believe in generational curses. They believe that demons can attach to bloodlines. They can they believe that a demon can enter you when you're in your mother's womb because of rejection that your mother didn't want you. And so a demon attached itself to you. They believe that if you play with Ouija boards and things like that, you are having um, demonic spirits attached to you. And it, it just goes on and on and on. And they will say, well, we don't focus on demons, but I don't hear a whole lot of teaching from them about sin, sanctification, um, crucifying the flesh, understanding that sin is still a problem for you, even as a believer, but you have the Holy Spirit to help you walk in power over sin. And so that's not being taught. And and. And people are not being discipled properly in a biblical fashion. Instead, they're, they're being told, well, you're dealing with a lust spirit. So you need to have that cast out of you instead of saying, no, you're in sin. And because you're in sin, you, the, the concern that I have is that people are not being biblically discipled properly. And instead of acknowledging sinful, uh, the sinful nature and the patterns there um, <clears throat> that we all deal with daily and, and learning how as a believer that yes, we are a saint, but we still have that sinful nature because we're in a fallen world and that we have not been left powerless or ill-equipped. We have scripture to help us to, to conform us to the image of Christ by his spirit. So we have the word of God to help us in, in the instruction and we have the Holy spirit to help us to, to kill sin, according to Romans 8, 13, to be led by the spirit, not by the flesh, to be conformed to the image of Christ, to, to not be left um, under the tyranny of Satan. And that's what I see the difference of is that we, as citizens of heaven, we're no longer under the tyranny of Satan. We have been empowered by the Holy Spirit to overcome the power of sin. But that's not talked about in this, in this deliverance ministry. It's all a focus on d- the demonic and experience. They will appeal to experience and say, well, you're going to tell a bunch of Christians, of believers that, that, that they haven't demons, haven't had demons cast out. Well, your experience doesn't interpret scripture. It's the scripture overrides that. And it's to test experience. You're going to tell Roman Catholics. That's what I want to say. You want to tell Mormons that because they cast out demons. They prophesy. They have apostles. You want to tell them that, that they're believers. You want to tell them that? Uh, do you want to tell, you know, I mean, the list could go on and on. So, you know, we can play that game too, if if they would like. Um, but it's just very concerning to me. And, yeah. and this comes from someone that was in this. I used to believe this and, and teach this and perpetuate this. I was part of deliverance sessions with other people. Um, I traveled overseas in Africa and saw things that, that took place. And I have, as a, as a person that recognized my own error, I had to go back to scripture and say, okay, I don't quite understand what happened here in this experience. And I'm at peace with that because I know what scripture says. And I'm going to stick with scripture. At the end of the day, I'm going to go back to what scripture says. And I'm encouraged in scripture that Colossians 1 tells me that God, that Christ delivered me from the domain of darkness and he's transferred me into his kingdom. And he's forgiven me of my sin. And yes, there are times that I deal with sin in my life on a, day, on a daily basis, even just the little things of my attitude and things like that. And I'm thankful that I have a high priest that's ever interceding for me. And I can go before God's throne, ask for forgiveness and ask by his spirit to be conformed daily to his image and be at peace with that. I'm, I'm encouraged that the, the battle, when I read scripture, the battle with the demonic is from without, not within me. You know, first John four, four says greater is he who is in in you than he who is in the world. So it's not a matter of denying that Satan exists or the demonic. It's just a matter of acknowledging who is greater than him and realizing that um, that the Holy Spirit is far greater than than the demonic. And my argument would be is that they diminish the power of the Holy Spirit by what they're doing. Amen. Amen. And they undermine, as you're talking about, the role of sanctification in the life of the believer. Yeah. And yeah. they elevate, they elevate, I mean, the thing that people have to understand is there's so little biblical data about angels and demons and even Satan. And that's intentional because as you're highlighting, we, we get obsess, obsessed about it and people are obsessed about it um, right. more than what God has said and what God means. Now, 
I think we we would both agree that you know no Christian that is indwelt by the Spirit. Every Christian has the Holy Spirit at the moment of conversion, um, and so no yeah. Christian can be possessed by a demon, Har- harassed. Right. Yes. Uh, that's why we have to humble ourselves under the. Uh, that's why Scripture again and again tells us to humble ourselves. I think of James four eight. Uh, Philippians or not Philippians, First Peter five six. In fact, before what's interesting about First Peter five six is uh, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and then what's the result? Cast your cares on the Lord. It's it's really an interesting. That's really interesting to me. But uh, we could go down that rabbit trail quite a bit. But uh, what most what most concerns you about the new apostolic reformation and their use of, you know the passion translation well as someone who used to read the passion translation um i understand its appeal um it's very uh poetic in its wording it's verbose in its (laughs) in its wording it's about 50 percent longer in many of the verses than um recognize actual translations. What concerns me about the passion now, um, and I am thankful for for individuals like Mike Winger, who who, sh- who shed light. Um, his videos were very helpful to me coming out of this when I began to look at this. Um, and when I watched the videos that he did initially before the Passion Project, I realized at that point, there is no way that I can be part of this Bible study. And like I said, that never came to fruition. So I'm very thankful for that. But the Passion Translation um, is not a translation. Um, from my understanding, Brian Simmons does not have biblical um, training in right. the in the languages, in the ancient languages, in linguistics with that. And he has even admitted, um, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, yeah, you were, you were following me. You, you, he, ha- yeah. he has no training. He has yeah. no uh, academic training. He has, he even admits that in, in yes. an interview. And yep. anyway. The interview he did with Jonathan Welton, um, I heard that one, and he said that he really relied on the Holy Spirit to help him. And I thought, OK. Um, and the wording that he's used, um, Winger did um, an extensive look at this. But if you look at the wording, he's inserted many words that are not in the original uh, manuscripts. He's activate breakthrough portals. Um, realms. I mean, there are many, and and he focuses on the anointing or the anointed ones. Um, his eschatology. Um, I know his. Uh, he's even changed his uh, in Revel how he's translated Revelation. That's made changes in what that means. Song of Solomon and how he translated it. There are people that have noted that he's changed the genre of Song of Solomon. I know Holly had called out um, several years ago that she had found um, questions in certain verses that he had translated. And then he made the changes and and said nothing about the updates. But yet he claims that Jesus commissioned him. And when you listen to him talk about his um, claim of being commissioned, it sounds like the apostles. In John, he says that Jesus came through his the wall of his room and breathed on him and commissioned him to write this new translation. This also sounds eerily like Joseph Smith. I mean, this sounds like something that that is cult that cult-like in, in, in the way that it's stated and also in, the, in an apostolic way. That's another example that's used. You'll hear these people that refer to themselves as apostles. It's almost like they appeal to these extreme supernatural experiences to validate being an apostle, which looks like scripture, uh, and, and being walking with Jesus. But, there, I mean, there's a lot of things that he said. He's alluded to the fact in interviews that um, he named the Bible, the Passion, after an angel. Uh, He said that on a Sid Roth interview, he stated that um, he was in heaven and he was given these books, one of which he wouldn't tell people what it was. Um, Another one was about Revelation. And then he said he wanted to steal a book in heaven and it was titled John 22. Mm -hmm. And he was stating that he wanted to take that book and Jesus told him that he would bring him back someday to give him that book and that this would be the chapter he knew that would usher in God's move and that it would uh, bring the greatest movement and it was the, to the fruition of greater things. And it that's adding to scripture, even though he tries to say that it's not, if you are saying that you're, you're making that, that drawing that conclusion and anybody could draw that conclusion that you're adding to, to the canon of scripture in saying that. So that, and probably other things I'm forgetting, it was all of that combined that it, it pulls up major red flags 
on that. And so it's for that reason. I have, a, I still have my copy, but again, for research purposes, but I do not read it and I would not recommend it. And we've, we've uh, done an episode, well, as you know, with Doreen on that. And it's interesting because in Bible translation theory, you have the best degrees from the best schools, you know, yeah. mastering of Hebrew and Greek. He has no experience ever translating right. the Bible, although he did work with new tribes. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's never led a team. It says on his website, you know, on the Passion Translation website, they have a team of translators. No team is listed. The thing right. that the thing that the thing that concerns me is you mentioned all those people earlier that endorsed uh, that modern apostle book by J. N. He's mm-hmm. one of them. Lou Engel, Bill Johnson, um, all those people that you mentioned. Um, all, all that is really good. I mean, you know, it is concerning. And so, just to compare that with, you know, we would you know, the best translations, they are in committee. There's no committee there. It's just, it's just one dude, you know, Brian Simmons with the Bible doing whatever he did. And, um, so that's not how Bible translation is done. Um, and that, that's not how you would, you would never hear that with the, any the new American standard Bible, the English standard version, um, they the, the English Standard Version, for example, not only has Hebrew and Greek scholars, they also have a theology committee, which was overseen by one of the greatest theologians when he was alive of the late 20th and 21st century, J.I. Packer. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, yeah, that's that that just is something that just add to your point. It refutes the idea that this guy, no education, no things and i know that he is proud he is proud to uh proud of boasting boastful of saying that people like me who have multiple master's degrees or even people that have more education than me with phds you know that have that knowledge i've heard he says to people like that well they're just overly sophisticated and so they're somehow not spiritual and i'm like wait a minute so you just diminished the role of education that the church has been um yeah. been about for like yeah. and forever yeah have you heard that too or uh, I, maybe i didn't hear that maybe i've heard i've heard that i don't know if there's like an actual source have you heard that too from him or oh yeah i've heard him say that and it's almost this um this attitude of well you the people that really focus on theology and um th- making sure the hebrew and the greek is correct and and worrying about that they're just religious or they have just have head knowledge and really don't have a relationship, really don't have that intimacy with God like he does. And that creates a hierarchy in Christianity that's not present in scripture. That's unbiblical. Um, There is no hierarchy. And we get to know God by his word. When he misappropriates and does not translate the the word correctly, then I think it's easy to, to even make the distinction that he's speaking of a God that we don't recognize in scripture. That's dangerous. Um, when you are not translating and honoring God correctly in translating, properly translating his word, and instead making it say something it doesn't say, then you're speaking of another God and you are not honoring God in doing that. And we are told to love God with all our minds, with all our hearts, with all our souls. We're to love essentially God with every part of our being and to, and you'll see this in this movement, not only by the the passion, but in this movement, for example, I know it's not just isolated this movement, but for for, uh, the sake of this discussion, you'll see that um, stated. You need, you just need to feel, you need to have an experience. You're overthinking things. Don't overanalyze. Don't think. You know, you need to feel, you need to let the Holy Spirit speak to you on this. You need to let your heart um, feel these things. And that's deceptive. That is deceptive. And we are told to use our minds in scripture. And to say that is is um, contradicting what the word commands us to do. Really good. Really good. You know, maybe maybe just briefly, you know, we're kind of talking about this already, but just to bring it out, we've talked on this show about Jesus calling and other things. And so what concerns you most about the idea of Christian, quote unquote, Christian mysticism, maybe the idea of contact with God through dreams and visions and 
hearing quote unquote directly from God apart from scripture? Well, this is something that I did quite a bit when I was in this. I I really my blog was full of and I have journals that um, were full of words that I attributed to God saying the Lord said, God said, Jesus said. And though that may sound nice um, and that may sound like that there's uh, fellowship going on. What essentially is happening is um, is that words are being ascribed to God that cannot be proven that he said. Uh, when I even look at my journal entries and, and blogs that I wrote, it was painful um, to, to realize that there were things I said that contradicted scripture. Um, people pulling Bible verses and, and um, ascribing extra biblical revelation to them that's not even within the text that you wouldn't that that you wouldn't have a group of people that would come together and they would they would have that um understanding illuminated to them so the concern is is that we that there are has been created extra biblical revelation that's ascribed to god and it is put on par with scripture even though people will say it's not the problem with saying that it's not is, is that we don't see um, we're not given any examples as a Christian when God speaks unauthoritatively. When we read scripture, we recognize its authority in our life. When we begin to make excuses for the prophetic and say, well, a false prophet is not someone who prophesies falsely. Well, that's not what the Bible says. So to make that claim is to contradict scripture. That's not what, what scripture says about that. And to say that that prophecy can be false today creates um, a dispensation that is worse than the Old Testament covenant. Yeah. And we are under a better covenant. So we're told that. So prophecy being fallible, um, it, it creates a lack of responsibility and accountability for um, error, for sin, for false prophecy. And again, it goes back to not honoring God the right way, leading people away from God. There's a that's a huge concern is that we're leading people away from God and to vain imaginations where uh, people are being told to rely on their dreams, to rely on their visions. You you may have a dream that that either came from your imagination, could be demonic potentially. You don't know. You can't say that that's from God. And then people are just being and in it, they're being led astray. I can't tell you. I mean, Dave, I used to have this book that was a dream dictionary. I threw it out after coming out of this, but I had a dream dictionary. Mm. Well, the new age has dream dictionaries mm. and they look very similar to um, the dictionary that I had. And so um, the dictionary is full of these meanings and these symbols. Well, where are these people getting these meanings from? It's not coming from scripture. So where are they getting the meanings for these different symbols? This is man-made teaching and we're relying on man's own understanding and and then we're and then the ultimate thing is that we're we're um basically acknowledging in, in an indirect way that scripture is not enough scripture is not sufficient we've got to have more and that's the main problem with this among the other things is that it's just never enough that scripture is not sufficient for instruction and correction and growing in the grace and knowledge of our lord and savior there's always got to be more and and I firmly believe as someone who who did this and, and repented of this is that we're creating this, the, the, the this belief is being created that you can experience God in your own way. You can hear God in your own way mm. while you're biblically illiterate. You don't know what scripture says. You don't know that what you're hearing is contradicting scripture. It's coming from your own imagination. It could be demonically inspired. Mm. Um and that you're not honoring God in the process and that you're not believing that scripture is sufficient for you. And to anyone that listens, um, I just want to say that scripture is sufficient. Scripture is sufficient. And you can grow in intimacy and fellowship with God by reading his word. You don't have to have these experiences, these supernatural mystical experiences to prove that you know God. You don't have to say, I hear the voice of God for myself to prove that you know God. You prove that you know God by his spirit in dwelling within you and you being transformed and it's a work of God that's that's being done in you and you reading scripture and having it written on your heart to where you're you're being transformed by it and you're not the person that you once were and that God gets all the glory for that. Mm. Um so that yeah. that's some of the concerns I have some as as someone who used to do similar things like that and and coming out of this. Amen. That's really well said. 
what concerns you most, and you talked about this, but what concerns you about the response of those in the New Apostolic Reformation to legitimate criticism found in Scripture and upon their own words? The word that comes to mind, and I've said this before, the word that comes to mind when I hear people, especially leaders, prominent leaders that defend and deny, defend leaders in this and then deny that the New Apostolic Reformation exists is gaslighting. I think there's a lot of gaslighting that goes on. And I don't know if it's, in, I can't say that it's intentional completely from everyone. It could be unintentional because of their ignorance of what's going on or that they choose to be blinded and they don't want to see it because they, they, know these people and minister with them, and they don't want to see it. Um, there's a lot of gaslighting that goes on. There's a lot of people that have been damaged by this movement. Um, there's people that have walked away from the faith. You know, there's a debate on, you know, if people were even part of the faith to begin with when they walk away. There's a lot of people that have been dam just damaged and abused because of the things that have gone on and, the, and their faith has been shipwrecked because of the teachings that take place. Marriages have been destroyed. Relationships have been destroyed. People don't really know and understand the sovereignty of God. And, and when things happen to them, they, you know, it, it it's just devastating on so many different levels. And um, it seems like that some of the leaders are actually more concerned about protecting the leaders than they are the sheep. It just seems like that there's there's this push sometimes to protect those leaders rather than to say, there's a problem here. We need to look more into this and to acknowledge this and to stop ignoring all of the books that are published, all of the videos that are made, all of the sermons that are preached that are alluding to this, even though they may not use that term, when they're still saying we believe that apostles and prophets exist today and they're supposed to govern the church and that they're needed and that we're to take the culture, we're to take the seven mountains of culture and that we need to do all of this stuff in order for Jesus to return um, and to have all this power and authority and these false aberrant practices and teachings. And then to say, well, the, but the never doesn't exist. So all you heresy hunters out there and all you people, these conspiracy theorists, you know, this, this isn't real. That's gaslighting. And I, again, I was someone I didn't know what I was part of for years. I didn't know what I was part of and but, but believed all of these things and ascribed to them and then coming out of it and having my eyes open and my and my ears open to hear and to understand. And I think I was a part of the NAR and I didn't even realize it. I wish that they would listen more to those of us that have that have come out of it instead of dismissing and saying eh, it's not real. There's nothing to see here. It, it's it's gaslighting. Yeah. Yeah, that's really good. And I think the other thing as you're talking about a separate point is – and I've heard this many times from people that are here in the area in Southern Oregon that I live in, and it's very prominent, the, NA, the End New Apostolic Reformation. And what they'll do is instead of reading their Bible, they'll read the latest book from the latest person. Mm -hmm. And so yep. that means that you're placing – even if you have – and many of these churches have statements of faith that where we could be like, hmm, you know, I like that. Uh, most of what that statement of faith says, but then if you place, then if you place the but that is correct that you're reading about the person, the your pastor or whatever apostle, above book latest book above the Bible, and um, you gotta you just undermine the authority of the Bible, the sufficiency right. of Scripture, and right. you are going to be biblically illiterate. What's what's the here's the thing? What's the difference between that? And pre-Reformation, what the what the Catholic Church did, correct. Yeah. There is no difference, nope. you know. So, and they will hold. I mean, even the books, but also going on Elijah list, um, charisma. I mean, I had a blog post published on charisma. Yeah. I had put, I had published on Elijah list. Those are two big ones. I mean, they have a quarter of a million, if not more, followers online that listen and read these blog posts and these videos. They they believe this. You have big numbers of people that are flocking to this, but yet they'll say, well, that's, you know, we have all these people that listen. Well, just because you have a big number of people doesn't mean that it's correct. Yeah. That's not the marker of it being correct and biblically sound. Well, Don, so, the Elijah, Elijah list is only an hour, I guess, an hour away from my house up in Eugene. Oh, really? You know, I'm only an hour away from that. I mean, we've had we the, in Eugene, they've had they since I've moved here like a couple of years, they've had Stephen Furtick, they had Hillsong, I think they've had Bethel. I mean, we had people from I'm only four hours uh away from four hours south of me is you know Bethel, 
And so they have people from their school of ministry coming up here. I mean, it is, it is bad. It is really wow. bad. It is. Mm. Uh, so yeah, all of that is, uh, this is where I'm like, Hey, you know, when I was in Idaho, just as an example, like it was the Mormons and they're just all over the place. And here it seems like this is all over the place. So I'm like, I'm just going to start studying it. I'm like, that's, that's what a good missionary does, you know? So it's yeah. been like really hammering down and i knew about this even like in 2012 when i was coming out of graduating seminary i knew about this i thought you know what there's no way that this is going to take hold and this is going to become this huge thing so i kind of was like eh, i'm not gonna you know keep up with it and i was like man i wish i had because you know um i knew some of the history and the, that kind of thing just looking at it at that time and now to yeah. see where it's metastasized is so tragic. It's really tragic. It is. And I and I, I hear from people and we we suffered the same thing is that it's really hard to find a biblically sound church um, that's not embracing some of this and is really wanting to value the word of God in, in the proper context and to to not focus on on all these other super like extra biblical things. Um, it, it's very difficult it's becoming more difficult for people to find a biblically sound church. And, and that's, that's troubling, but that's still at the same time, we can be encouraged that there are biblically sound churches out there. And sometimes it may just take time when you're coming out of this to find them, but they're out there. You should pray about that too, guys. You should pray about that because you know, the chief shepherd, he is, he's a good chief shepherd and he will always lead you to a good church. And so if you pray about that, uh, he'll send you, he'll send you to a, He'll send you to a good church where you'll be loved and cared for, um, and you can sit under the word and under trustworthy, good, solid teaching. He will. It may not be, and and it may not be exactly what you want either. You know, you might have to give up some of your preferences, but you know, it's it's uh, it's worth it. Where yep. can where can people go to find you on social media? Tell us about your podcast. Tell us about your writing. Those kind of things again. Yeah. So you can find me on social media, on Instagram and Facebook. Um, I'm uh, under the Love Sick Scribe. And then I have a blog. Um, it's called lovesickscribe.com. And that was the name that it had when I was in this movement. I know some people have asked me, they said, why didn't you change the name of it? Well, I left it because I still had, uh, there were people that were following that I still wanted to be able to reach. And so <laughs> I lost a lot of followers <laughs> when my writing changed, but I left the, the name and really that's, you know, I'm a writer and, um, and I, and I desire the word of God. I desire to know the truth of the word of God. And so I just left it, but my blog is um, lovesickscribe.com. And then the the podcast is, is the same. It's all easy to find. It's the love six scribe podcast. And I usually write um, and podcast weekly. Uh, that works out for my schedule. It'd be nice if I could do it more, but at this point, at this point in, in life, I'm a stay-at-home mom. I homeschool. Um, I have two kids, um, and so, and other things that I, the hats I wear, and so I've got uh, lots of thing, lots of irons in the fire. And so at this point, God has at least graced me to be to do what I've done right now, and I'm hoping to write a book um, in the near future about. Um, the things that I've believed and to hopefully help others to glean from some of my blog posts that I've written to yeah. go through them and try to compile and focus on some different topics that are in there um, to help hopefully shed light on that and to maybe help others that have come out of this to, to glean and look towards scripture, not, not to glean towards necessarily what I'm saying, point more towards scripture and to, uh, to go back to what the word of God says and to, and to have better understanding of it. Well, you know, there's a lot that we could talk about when it comes to this topic. And just as we, you know, end the conversation, Don, um, do you have any takeaways for those who listen and watch the show? Yeah, I would I would say, you know, do your research. If you're wondering about the new apostolic reformation and you're hearing people say, oh, this is not a real thing, or maybe they're by chance, there may be people listening that you listen to uh, well-known leaders in these types of movements that are saying, eh, there's nothing here. It's a conspiracy theory. These are just heresy hunters. You need to do your own research. Um, don't just listen to people because you like them. You need to do your research. You need to understand why there's a plethora of books out there that talk about the new apostolic reformation. And that's not coming from people that are saying something against it. These are people that are acknowledging that that exist and that they're 
they endorse it. Um, go back to the word of God. The word of God is our standard for truth. And um, if you've been under teachings that you've heard Bible verses being pulled out of context, you need to go back and read in context before the verse, after the verse. Be a good Berean. Um, there's nothing wrong with being a good Berean and knowing scripture. We are all responsible for our understanding of the word of God. And we are all responsible and going to be held accountable for knowing what this word says. And it is sufficient. This word is sufficient for you to grow in your understanding and your fellowship with God and, um, and, and to be encouraged by his word. This is what we need to go to in our times of the mountaintop times, the metaphorical mountaintop times, and this is the time, this is the word we need to go to in our valley times. Um, we trust God. We we know that He's sovereign. We trust Him in, in every season of life. Um, and so value His word. Don't don't believe that you have to go to, to appeal to something outside of His Word to hear Him. For those that may hear this that have come out of this movement, know that there's hope. There's hope. It doesn't feel like it at the moment when you come out. Um, it can be very lonely. It can, you can feel lost and like that you're, that you're alone, but there's hope. And there's people out there that um, are willing to help you, to come alongside you, to encourage you, to guide you back to the word of God. Don't isolate yourself. Get around other fellow believers um, and share as, as you feel comfortable sharing at the time. But um, know that there's hope and that our hope is in, is in Christ. Thank you so much for that, Don. That was really well said. And uh, guys, uh, we've been talking today with Dawn Hill. I want to encourage you to check out her blog, check out her podcast here soon. Lord willing, uh, American Gospel 3 will be released and mm -hmm. Dawn will be in it. So I encourage yep. you to check out that too. So thank you, Dawn, for your time and ministry. I appreciate you having me on, Dave. I've enjoyed it. Me too. Thank you for listening to the Equipping You and Grace podcast. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe, rate us on the app, and share this with your friends and family on social media. If you want to find us on social media, you can find us on Twitter at Servants of Grace, on Instagram at Servants of Grace, or by searching at Servants of Grace on Facebook. You can also find this episode and many others like it on the front page of our website, servantsofgrace.org.